Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And so we're going to be looking at verses 16 and 17, especially today, this idea of uh, what happens when we let the Word of God dwell in us. I, I, tied, I gave the lesson this morning, the title, Going by the Book. And uh, you'll notice that it's going by the book one. That means we're going to have another lesson to finish up this a little bit later. But going by the book, doing things by the book. Now, immediately in my mind, when I started thinking about that, you know, doing things by the book is almost no one today, or I shouldn't say no one, uh, um, uh, very popular today to kind of uh, uh, put down people who do things by the book. Uh, you know, it's kind of a legalistic type of a phrase. Our world thinks of that as kind of a legalistic type of thing when a person does things by the book. Uh, you think about the military officer who uh, hasn't any common sense, he just follows the book. Uh, or, um, you know, a judge, you know, who's just throws the book at a person. Or, um, you know, a policeman, you know, who's by the book. And immediately I thought of Barney Fife, you know. Uh, uh, well, Andy, Article 3, Section 1.4 says, and, you know, we do it by the book. And the idea was, is Barney Fife was uh, incompetent. He couldn't do the job, so he just had to list the book. And, uh, you know, you think of doing things by the book, there's got to be... Uh, some sense in things as well. You've got to put some common sense into your, into your thinking. A lot of people, I think, do that with the Bible. And, you know, we've got this book, and it teaches us a lot of things, and a lot of it is good, but you've got to use some good old-fashioned common sense around the Bible, and you don't want to just do the book. You've got to put some good old-fashioned horse sense in this thing too. And, and, and I want to tell you, um, it is not legalism and incompetency to, as a, for a believer to follow the book and to obey the word of God. Um, and in fact, anything else would be a kind of heresy to, to, to get this idea that we're going to take the Bible and we're going to pick out pieces of it we like and then we're going to do what we want to. There's other things, you know, that just good common sense says this book doesn't work in that area, so I'm not going to follow the book in that area. I'm going to do something else because wisdom and experience and, and, um, and, and, and the majority of people have decided that doing these things, um, you know, that they're not right. And so I'm not going to follow the book in that one area. And I just want to say, we, don't, we have no grounds, no right as, as believers to decide what parts of the Bible we do and do not like and what parts of the Bible we do and do not want to obey. We have no right, no, no grounds to tweak the Bible to fit into our own lifestyles. Our lives should be based on the book and not the other way around. We don't base the book on our lifestyle and on our experiences we change our life to fit the word of God. At least if we're going to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what we're going to do. So in Colossians 3 and verse 16, again, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And then what he does after that is he lists, uh, gives us a list of several, I'm going to call them like articles, Barney Fife. Article 1, section, Article 3, section 1.04 says, and so a list of several articles here uh, uh, that God says that this is what going by the book is like. The Bible says that if the word of God is dwelling in us, if the word of God lives in us richly and we're obeying the word of God, there are going to be several things that, that happen in our life we're going to be doing that are a part of living by the book. And it reaches into uh, the, the list that he gives, reaches into chapter uh, 4, Colossians chapter 4, and really divides into two different categories. There is the first category, I'm going to call them spiritual articles. And then the second category I'm going to call practical articles. So the first one, these are, are, are things, the first section are going to be things that have to do with, um, with, with, with the spiritual man, the spiritual life, and, and things that are, are spiritual have to do with worship and so forth. The second section is going to have to do with uh, practical things like um, the home, uh, raising children, uh, and have to do with uh, being at the workplace. And he's going to deal with areas that when, when we have the Word of God dwelling in us, and when we're obeying the Word of God, it's going to affect how we, we relate to our, our spouse, and it's going to, re, uh, relate to, it's going to affect how we relate, relate to um, uh, our children, and it's going to affect how we relate to our parents, and it's going to affect how we relate to the work world. 
And he's going to deal with those things. Today, we're going to focus in verses 16 and 17 on those spiritual articles that are found here uh, in these verses. Be before we get started on that, one more thing I want to point out as we, uh, we get going here. So in verse 16, he says, let the word of God Christ dwell in you richly. And then he goes on from there to give this, this list of articles. And the interesting thing is, is this same list of Articles is found a second time in the Bible. It's in Ephesians chapter 5. It starts in verse 18 and then goes down through uh, into chapter 6. I'm going to read part of it to you, uh, the part that has to do with, that's, that's parallels verses 16 and 17. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20 says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God, and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you read chapter 5, starting in verse 18, all the way down to about halfway through chapter 6, it, it becomes very obvious that, that Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 and Colossians chapter 3 and 4, these are parallel passages. They're both written by the Apostle Paul to different congregations, but they're both written by the Apostle Paul. And it's kind of an interesting connection because, remember, at least this is what the scholars believed happened. The scholars believed that while the Apostle Paul was planting the church and teaching and training the people in Ephesus, that um, Epaphras, Epaphras and uh, Philemon came down from the city of Colossae, which is a hundred and some miles away, came down to the city of Ephesus to do some economic business, to do, take care of some, some legal matters or some economic business, met the Apostle Paul, they were saved, and they go back to their city of Colossae. Uh, Philemon opens up his house as a place for the church to meet, and Epaphras becomes the, the pastor of that church. And so there's a connection between the city of Ephesus, the church in the city of Ephesus, and the church in the city of Colossae, and now we find that there are these two parallel passages, and they are really very similar, not word for word, but they are very, very similar, uh, uh, Ephesians 5 and 6 and Colossians 3 and 4. The only difference is, is how they begin. This list of, uh, you know, of, of characteristics or qualities or marks of these believers, the only difference is, is, is how they begin. Uh, the book of Colossians says, when the word of Christ dwells in you, this is what's going to be a part of your life. And the book of Ephesians says that if you are filled, the word filled by the Holy Spirit means to be controlled with. Um, so he said, be not drunk with wine, but be filled, wherein is excess, but be filled by the Holy Spirit. And the idea is, you know, when your person is drunk with alcohol, the alcohol controls them. They're not doing what they would normally do. They, uh, they don't have the same restraints in the same sense that they would normally have. And they're controlled by the spirit of the alcohol. And, and the apostle says in Ephesians, he says, rather than being controlled by the spirit of alcohol, I want you to be controlled by or filled by the spirit of God. And then he says, if you're filled by the Spirit of God, then these are going to be the marks. This is going to be the evidence that you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, that you're going to be doing the same things that he says in Colossians are marks of being obedient to God's Word. So I'd like to just point out today that it is not legalistic to obey the Bible. It's spiritual. To be a by-the-book kind of Christian is not legalism. It's being spiritual. It's being godly. It's being led of, controlled by, and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. It is heresy to take the Bible and say, I read it, and I see what it says, but I just don't think it'll fit into my world today. And so I'm going to tweak it a little bit to fit how I want things to go and how I think things should be, uh, be and, and instead we just follow the Word of God. It's not legalism to obey the Bible, it's spiritual. So, four things, I want to go back to the book of Colossians, chapter 3, of 16 and 17. Four things that he says are marks of, of Christians who are kind of by the book sort of Christians. At least the four things that have to do with the spiritual nature today, we'll go into the other ones, uh, 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 the Lord willing, next week. Or, he says, number one, four marks of... Uh, Four marks of the person who, is, is, uh, who has the word of Christ dwelling in him richly. Number one, he's teaching and admonish. They teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. He's going to teach 
and admonish is the same kind of word as encourage or push, uh, urge people on spiritually. But he says we're going to do this in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. One of the first things that I notice right here is that uh, singing then is not for the gifted and the talented. A lot of times, you know, people say, boy, I wish, you know, a singer comes up and says, boy, I wish I had your talent. I wish I had the gift of music or the gift of singing that you have. And, 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 and I thank the Lord. I do believe God gifts people, gives give people the gift of music. And uh, I think it becomes obvious uh, when, uh, you know, our pianists come to the piano or versus when maybe I come to the piano. And, uh, you know, whether one has a gift and one of them doesn't or one at least is, is learned and the other one isn't at the very, at the very least. And, and there's a certain amount of uh, gift and talent that is involved in in music at church, but, um, but I notice in this passage, he's talking about a person who lets the word of Christ dwell in him, that this is a person who uh, teaches, admonishes, and admonishes others in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In other words, every believer ought to be involved in the music ministry at church. It's not one of those things where just those who are gifted and talented get to do. Every believer ought to be involved in the music ministry of the church, and we can do that. It's pretty easy for us to do that. That's why in our church we have congregational uh, singing. It's so that every one of us can participate in the music ministry of the church. And it's why we try to, when we have, uh, you know, when we do our congregational singing, we try to encourage people, uh, everyone to get involved, you know, to everyone to take a hymnal. And, and, you know, we don't just pass, we don't have hymnals and say, okay, now if you can read music, we'll let you have one of these books. Um, if you have a good voice, we'll let you have, we want to audition the people who get to sing in the congregation. I understand, I've heard that Charles Spurgeon kind of did, they, they didn't use a piano at Spurgeon's church in the, seven, in the 1800s uh, in England, and uh, so they didn't use music. It was a, a large auditorium, they didn't have um, amplifying systems like we do today, and that's probably, it had a little bit to do with it. Culture uh, also had something to do with it, but what they would do is, um, as every service, they would put on the seat, every, every chair would get get uh, a sheet of paper with the words to the songs that were going to be done that day with a note that said if you don't know how to sing harmony if you can't keep a tune please don't sing <laughs> big room you know all that you know we don't want you messing up what's going to happen right now and and uh, but but and I, I hear that Charles Spurgeon did that but we try not to do something like that here we want everyone to get involved in music because the Bible tells us that when I am obeying the word of God when I'm obedient to the word of God that I'm going to teach and admonish others in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So it gives us these three sorts of music that's, that's listed here. Uh, and, uh, you know, what's the difference? We call them all hymns, don't we? Open your hymnal too. And we're going to sing hymn number. And, uh, but there is a difference there's in, in, in the kind of music that we do. And so just kind of a rough outline of what they are. This is real basic here. But psalms are, basically speaking, psalms are, are scripture set to music. And I could give you better uh, illustrations than the one that I, I've got for you but uh, uh, that I'm going to give. Because some songs are, are really almost uh, totally uh, Bible verses that have just been set to music. But, but other songs um, have some scripture or they are at least based on a piece of scripture, have a piece of scripture associated with it. If it's not a direct quote of a passage, it'll be based on a passage. Uh, one of them I just picked out today, um, the hymn number, in our hymnal, uh, hymn number 103 is to the regions beyond. And it says this, it says, to the regions beyond, I must go, I must go, where the story has never been told. To the millions that never have heard of his love, I must tell the sweet story of old. And it's based out of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16 where the apostle Paul says to the uh, says to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready uh, to our hand and so he says I'm gonna I want to take the gospel to the regions beyond and here's a song a, a psalm that we sing that has to do with that passage of scripture it's teaching the idea of that song is to teach us that passage of scripture what it means uh, to take the gospel to the regions beyond us and to go beyond. Uh, the second uh, kind of music that he mentions is our, would be hymns. And uh, whereas a psalm is scripture to set to music, a hymn is doctrine set to music. 
Uh, probably one of the most famous of those is Amazing Grace, uh, hymn number three in, in, our, uh, in our hymnal. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. It was written by John Newton, who was a pastor in England, and, um, and Newton uh, and his good friend uh, William Cooper uh, uh, kind of joined together. Cooper was a member of, of Newton's church and uh, was a was all, uh, a well-known, famous poet of his day, and the two of them joined together to uh, to put together a hymnal, uh, songs and hymns that could be used in uh, their church to teach the doctrines that they believed, and the and and so they would very often um, write music, and they put collected it as time went on. They put a collection of them together, but they would write a song based upon what they were going to be teaching and preaching in church that week. And uh, actually, it's an interesting, kind of an interesting story. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of it, but Amazing Grace, the la um, William Cooper was, um, 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 uh, he, he faced chronic depression uh, and had attempted suicide a number of times. In fact, that's how, um, uh, how Cooper and Newton came to, 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 to be, uh, be friends as Newton's attempts to try to help this man who was so depressed. He's a famous poet. Uh, but he was so depressed that he had attempted suicide on a number of occasions. And um, the last time William Cooper attended uh, any church service was the first time the song Amazing Grace was ever sung. And uh, after that, he stayed in, in Newton's house for a lot of years. He lived with, with John Newton. And he stayed in Newton's house, or next to Newton's house. Stayed there, um, and they stayed friends. And Newton came and visited him uh, weekly, but he never would attend church again. He was, uh, the depression uh, just ate him up after that. And, uh, but Amazing Grace, and it's the story, Amazing Grace is, is um, the story of John Newton, who had been a, uh, uh, the captain of a slave ship, had actually been a slave himself for a period of time, uh, then worked his way up to the captain of a slave ship, and in the middle of a storm got saved, and then later became a preacher, and uh, Amazing Grace is the story of John Newton and, and what God did in his life. It's doctrine set to music, and then spiritual songs, that's application set to music, so um, I I have, I, and I have the Bible, and I have some doctrines, some things the Bible teaches me. Application is what do I do with the Bible and what, the, when, what it teaches me. And, and so there are some songs that are meant to, uh, to cheer and to encourage and to urge us on and to provoke us unto love and good works. I picked out uh, as an example uh, hymn number 34, Living by Faith. It says, I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth over e or everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arm, I am living by faith and feel no alarm. It's just, you know, an application of the truths in the word of God and what it means to live by faith and what happens when we live by faith. And uh, now we always say when we, you know, when, we, when we're singing in the congregational service, and you'll hear this pretty frequently if it's not Pastor Caleb or Brother po Poling, it'll be one, someone will come up and they'll say, now sing it out to the Lord sing it out to the Lord but um, uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse uh, 16 tells me that I'm supposed to sing it out to my brothers and sisters there's a place I, I'm going to show you this in a minute there, we are to sing to the Lord as well but I am singing for the benefit of my brothers and sisters in church when we sing our congregational songs I'm using uh, the music to try to teach one another we're trying to teach one another through uh, the psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs that we sing and so your participation in congregational singing I mean it's vital it's an important thing that you be a part of the singing when we get ready to sing it's very important that you'll pick up a hymnal and, uh, and that you open up to the, to, the, to the hymn that we're singing and that you, uh, that you you sing the song and that you sing it with gusto and, and life and that you, you, you put your heart into it because it's kind of how you're preaching to one another. Don't you ever once in a while wish you could tell somebody in church exactly what you think? <laughs> well, just take that hymn and say, brother, sister, I know, and just sing it out like you're just yelling it in their face and uh, only, only on tune. Key and key and all that kind of stuff, all right? But your participation in, in congregational singing, it's evidence that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, book of Ephesians, and it's evidence that you're being obedient to this book. Be obedient to the book. Number two, closely related to the teaching and admonishing one another is he says, singing with grace in your hearts, 
Here's it is to the Lord. So I am going to sing not only to my brothers and sisters uh, in the congregational singing so that they can be taught and encouraged, but I am going to also do this to the Lord. I'm going to sing with grace in my heart to the Lord. Now, the singing is not meant to lift up the speaker. That's why I really discourage applauding. And if someone applauds, I, you know, don't get, you know, we don't rebuke them or something like that. But that's why we don't encourage applauding after a person sings. Because this hasn't anything to do, when we sing at church, have specials and so forth, it doesn't have anything to do with the person who sings. It's not like we're trying to, you know, lift them up and wow, what a beautiful voice and all that kind of stuff, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I think amen is appropriate during a song. Praise the Lord is appropriate because what we're doing then is we're trying to address the message and what we learned in the music. But it's not to lift up the singer, nor is it to entertain the audience. And so uh, we're not trying to bring in, you know, get people who have the very, very best voices, you know, and they can win American Idol or something like that. And have, we're trying to, with not, the point isn't to, to do that. The point is, uh, is um, uh, to sing with grace to, in our hearts to the Lord. And uh, so you think about this, the word grace. He says, I want you to sing with grace. The word grace uh, comes from a Greek word that means, it's charisma, it means a gift. When I sing, um, I'm giving a gift to God. That's what he's teaching there. I'm giving a gift to God. When we sing uh, the congregational songs, I, I am teaching my brothers and sisters in the congregation through the song, but I'm also offering a gift to the Lord in that song. It's an act of worship. When we sing, it's an act of worship. Again, it's important that everyone be a part of it. So because it's an act of worship and it's a gift, it's uh, done with grace and sung in our hearts. Uh, how does he say it? Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Um, it, it, it's n we're not supposed to sing um, in a cold, formal, kind of technical way. Uh, when we sing, it's supposed to be done uh, uh, from the heart with passion and uh, emotion and, and reverence for the Lord. There ought to be, um, there ought to, there ought to be uh, energy in our voices when we sing, uh, not just look at the words and sing them and technically get every note just right and so forth. And uh, that's not the point. We're trying to, we're, 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 we're singing with, with a heart given over to the Lord. Um, now, and we ought not sing under our breath. If we're going to sing, you know, sing, sing in your heart, well, if it's in my heart, you know, I can do it with my mouth closed. And that's not the point. There is a time when I think it's right to sing when it'd be appropriate to, uh, uh, you know, sing quietly. You know, there are places where, uh, you know, it may not be um, the appropriate or the right uh, possible. It may not be possible to sing out loud, uh, but uh, especially when we're in the house of the Lord, we ought to be sing we ought to we ought to be singing with uh, with energy and gusto, and we ought to kind of let our heart bust out, filled with love for the Lord. All right, number three. These are kind of the spiritual things. Doing these by the book. When the word of God dwells in you, number three, you'll do everything in the name of the Lord. Verse 17, and whatsoever you do in word or do, deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. All right, so now there's a couple of things, two ways to, uh, two things to see in this section, I think. First of all, he says what we're going to do, we're going to do in the name of the Lord. And um, so that means a couple of things. First of all, that, um, you know, a couple of ways to, to look at that phrase, you know, do, do whatever we do in the name of the Lord. Uh, what's it mean to do it in the name of the Lord? Well, it means, first of all, it could mean that we only do what he authorizes. I do it in the name of the Lord. I do it only what the Lord authorizes. So that would be like um, uh, someone who is the servant of the king, and, uh, and he comes over and he says, the king sent me to read this declaration. Uh, and the guy who's reading the declaration, he doesn't get to change it. He's doing this in the name of the Lord. He has no authority in his own, but his authority comes from the king. And, this, and his authority is, comes from the fact that the king sent him to read this thing and to do this thing. And, um, and there's a, there is a, a way to say this, that whatever I do, I'm supposed to do in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, um, there are some things that would be a little bit hard to, uh, to claim that. And some people try to do that and say, well, uh, um, you know, I took this job. I, I, I claim this job in the name of the Lord. I come and fill out this, and God told me to tell you to hire me for this job. And people do those kind of things sometimes. God told me to tell you to hire me for this job. And uh, that kind of a thing. And, well, they, um, and then sometimes, I know a couple of cases where that's happened, where a person goes up and says, God told me to tell you to hire me. And, uh, and the guy that's on the hiring side said, well, God didn't tell me. 
And, uh, you know, so sometimes, you know, that can be taken, you know, th that can be taken a little bit of, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to prove that God's authorized you to do everything that you think that you ought to be doing there. But there's another way to take this verse that I think really fits the passage a little bit better. He says, uh, and that would be this, that we do, that we only do things that we, we only do the things we do to honor him. Um, I'm going to do what I do in a way realizing that whatever I do is going to reflect on the Lord and I want to make sure that whatever I do honors him in some way. In fact, I think this is the right way to take the passage because of that qualifying word whatsoever that he's got in there. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. So whatever, whatever I do is that I'm going to do, whatsoever I do, I want to make sure that I do it in a way that brings glory to his name. For a lot of years now, um, uh, I've been wanting to have um, uh, shirts. I want, to, I want to have it so that every shirt I own well, all of my work shirts, except for my t-shirts, but all the shirts that I wear, that they all have the name of the church on them. I went, and uh, so several years ago, three years ago, four years ago, I bought my wife this uh, sewing machine so that can, that can embroider, so that she could, she could do that. She could take every one of my shirts, my dress shirts and my work shirts and my casual shirts, and that every shirt, so that everywhere I go, all the time, if I go out to get hay for my horses, I've got Bible Baptist Church of Pew all up on my shirt. If I, uh, you know, run down to the store to get something, I buy Bible Baptist Church of Puyallup on my shirt, and, and uh, so I bought her this this uh, uh, this uh, sewing machine that can do it. The only thing is, you got to be smarter than the sewing machine to make it do it. And so uh, this year, she she made me a couple of them. Oh, I don't know. Two years ago, we tried it uh, during the summertime. We bought it, and she tried it, and and I think she, if I remember right, it was six shirts, and three or two of them worked, and four of the shirts went in the trash. <laughs> And we kind of got discouraged. <laughs> you know, you know, shirts are expensive, even work shirts. And, uh, and so anyway, um, without telling me, she broke it out this week, the sewing machine. And she took two of my work shirts and practiced on them. And then did, uh, so she did nine shirts all together this week. And so I've got the shirt I have on right now uh, has Bible Baptist Church P. All up on it. And, but, you know, uh, years ago when I started thinking about doing this, having that on, I thought there, there is a negative to having it so that every single solitary shirt that I have has Bible Baptist Church appeal all up on it. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's um, 8 o'clock at night, and we're just getting ready to, to turn into bed, and Anita says, oh, I forgot this. Will you throw on some clothes and run to the grocery store and buy this for me? And, you know, and so me, being as you know, the kind of fantastic husband that I am, you know, very willingly get dressed, you know, and throw on one of my shirts and I run to the store. But, you know, I'm grumpy. It was bedtime and she should have got that at, you know, three o'clock when she was at the store. She shouldn't have forgotten it. And, you know, and why isn't she getting closed and getting her clothes on and go to the store? Why am I having to do this? And I was in bed and I am, you know, all that kind of stuff when I get to the store and I, you know, and I walk in there and I can't find the thing because after all, what guy in their right mind knows what, what you know, Know, they, it's stores. There's no rhyme or reason to stores. You walk into a store and I can't figure out where the things are and why do they put those things in the places they put them and I can't find them. I walk through aisle after aisle and it's getting to be close to closing time and they can't find someone working there at, at, for anything. No one, no one to help you to, uh, to find the thing and I'm starting to get flustered and upset and ah, oh, where is that thing? And the person that I'm yelling at sees Bible Baptist Church appeal all up on my shirt. That didn't actually happen. I'm making this whole thing up because, you know, uh, I'm serious. It didn't happen. Anita went to the store, not me. And so, and so it didn't happen. And so, I'm making this up. I even made that part up. Actually, but she did go to the store last night, but I had the grandkids. And so, uh, anyway. <laughs> Um, why do I do that to myself? And so now you won't listen to anything I say. But, uh, you know, the, 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 that's what, he, what he's saying. You see, if I've got it on, if, if I'm always wearing Bible Baptist Church, then everything that I do reflects on the church. And that's what he's saying in this passage of Scripture. He says, uh, Christian, understand that everything you do reflects on your Savior. And so make sure that whatever you do, whatsoever it is, that you do it in his name. You're carrying his name with you everywhere you go. Make sure that what you do honors him. 
That would be, um, I think, the right way to, to, to uh, interpret verse 17. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Remembering that everything you do reflects on the Lord some way. All right, I've got to get done. I just noticed I'm out of time and I've got one more little one to do. See, whatsoever. You didn't need this, did you? Whatsoever. Let me see. I forgot to flip that switch there. Okay, yeah, I wanted to show you this. I know you can't hardly see this, and that's pretty good anyway because it's really new agey. One of my, my mom's cousins sent me this this week, and she was trying to be spiritual, and she was trying to be, you know, a blessing to me and all oh, this thing. So, uh, so it, this little thing says, never own a disease. And I'm going to come over where I can read it a little bit better. Never own a disease. If a person, you're talking about a person who's got a chronic illness or, or sickness, he says, here's how you keep that disease from controlling. I thought it was interesting in a couple of ways. It's got a snake. Uh, you know, shooting at the head, and it's got a shield, like the shield of faith, uh, protecting the head there. But he said, here's how you keep it from, here's how you prevent a disease from controlling you or owning you. Number one, reduce the amount of time that you talk about being ill. And number two, refuse to allow the illness, um, what's it say? Refuse to allow the illness a place in your consciousness or in your thought. Uh, you ever meet someone who just everything that they do um, is I mean they're identified by their illness um, it's all they talk about it's all you know everything about them is all about uh, you know their sickness or their illness and all that and the idea they're identified by their illness but you know some other people don't you who have uh, chronic illnesses but you wouldn't hardly ever know it about them because that's not what they talk about their life isn't defined by whatever illness that they have. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe the same kind of struggle, struggles as a person who, uh, you know, all you see is their pain. I want to suggest to you that rather than being owned by negative things in our lives as Christians, that we ought to be owned instead by positive things. And so what he says in the last section, when you're living by the book, is you give thanks to God. Is what he says, isn't it? Verse 17, giving, do all in the name of Lord, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And uh, we ought to be identified, we ought to be marked, we ought to be known for our thankfulness. Um, and I think there's two things that we can do that might help us do that. I, I got the idea from that little cartoon or whatever it is that my cousin sent. Two things that might help us so that we become possessed by thankfulness rather than by, um, in, uh, by ingratitude, that kind of thing. Number one, increase the time, amount of time we talk about being thankful. And then secondly, insist on giving thanksgiving a place in our mind. Think about thanks, thank, uh, thanksgiving, being thankful, and talk about being thankful. And what will happen is people will think you're a thankful person. <laughs> But if you talk about other things and think about those other things, you'll become identified with the negative things. I want to be known as a positive, kind of thankful type of a person rather than a negative, kind of unhappy sort of person. I want to think about uh, positive things, thankful things, things why I'm thankful to God, and then I want to talk about reasons that I'm thankful.